the expectations that I set for individuals is I want on your worst days for you to be good. Because if we can make good your baseline, your great days are going to be exceptional. But at worst, you are still good. And that's good enough. And so then you take out the concept of failure because you can't fail. Even if your worst days, you're just good. You're moving, no matter how fast or slow, still oriented towards the objective outcome that you're seeking. And that's still good enough. What's going on, y'all? Hope you're well. Welcome back to a brand new episode of Dieting from the Inside Out. And I have the arguably epitome of Dieting from the Inside Out episode today. Um, I am interviewing a friend of mine. Her name is Kate Ann Michelle, and she is an absolute master when it comes to the inner game mindset as it applies to weight loss. I'm telling you, when it comes to the goals of goal achievement, trying to transform your body, transform your life, she has a one, we, we share very, very similar philosophies to all of this, but this is from a totally different perspective. Kate is a speaker. She's an expert coach. She is also extremely, extremely well-versed in where the mindset, headspace, inner game pieces work inside weight loss. So in this episode, we get into a lot. Let me put my notes up really quickly. Um, we get into a lot. We're going to talk about her and her story because she had gone through, or she has a crazy story um, from her pro athlete days um, to her own um, issues and darkness and how she came through all that. Uh, we're going to be talking about a lot about that. Um, basically talking about where to even start with mindset, where to even start with this inner game work, because a lot of people get derailed right there. They're like, I, I know I'm in my own way, but I don't know what that means. I don't know what I'm missing. So we talk a lot about that and what you are missing to start getting your headspace and your mindset in check to get these goals that you're trying to reach. Uh, what else we get into? We talk more about her story, like I said, with her professional athlete background and how she was able to get out of that 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 side of her brain and into the, what's now and, and how she changed her life. Um, talking about how identity changes everything and how to go about rewriting your identity. Um, talking a lot about how you can be present and how to, like if you avoid, or not avoid, if you struggle with being present and struggle with being in the now and you're always focusing and getting anxious about like the future and, or you're worried about you because your identity is stuck in the past. We talk a lot about how to fix that. Um, and then ultimately just how to change these narratives and how to change your entire life and perspective around all of these things and ultimately get out of your own way and stop sabotage. That's what we get into in today's episode. And uh, let me just say, you're going to want to stick around for the whole thing. It's so good. Um, and you're definitely going to want to reach out and follow her. Um, but otherwise, before we get into all the goods, because like I said, once we start the actual interview, it's, it's a lot. Um, but before we do that, I do want to say a big thank you to the sponsors of the show. Sponsor number one is Flex Pro Meals, because if you're struggling with and you want your 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 meals streamlined, this is one of the easiest ways to, to do it. And a lot of people say, Jared, I just don't want to have to think about it. And the only way to not to truly not have to think about it is have your meals prepped, ready, cooked, and just ready to eat. And this is the easiest way to do it. And the nice thing is they're cheaper than going through a drive-thru, especially if you use my discount. But otherwise, if you're into that kind of thing, check them out at flex, flexpromeals.com or you hit the link below. Like I said, I have a code. If you use it, Hamilton Trained at checkout, it'll save you like 20%. Um, we also have have a sec our second sponsor, which is First Form. I'm wearing one of their shirts. They just sent this one to me the other day. Um, because we all know that supplements are not the end-all be-all. They are exactly what they are termed, which is a supplement, but they do have their time in their place and not all supplements are created equal. A lot of people think that it's just all protein powders, protein powder, all vitamins are vitamins, but it's not true. And if you are not getting what you need from food, if you're not getting enough omegas, you're not getting enough fruits and vegetables, you're struggling to hit your protein intake without going over on your calories, you're not getting in um, you're, you're whatever else you need, you may consider supplements. Now, but like I said, I don't want you to go get stuff that isn't accurate or isn't safe or it's made in someone's basement. I want you to get what your money deserves and you deserve and get the highest quality you can get. That's why we work with First Form. So definitely check them out. Hit the link below. There's a free shipping deal going on, I believe. But otherwise, I will. Uh, get into the interview now. Uh, I know I can't wait for you to hear this. I know you're going to get a ton of value out of it. I'll talk to you soon. Beautiful. I think we are recording. What's up? How are you, Kate? I'm doing amazing. <laughs> I'm doing amazing. How are you? No complaints. Dogs are relaxed. Like I think so, like right before that we hopped on, um, there's like someone's dropped off groceries. Like I think we, my wife ordered groceries. And so all the dogs are like, terrorist is here. So I'm like, fuck, I'm hopping on a show in like three minutes. <laughs> calm down. Calm down. Needless to say, my house doesn't get broken into because I got three dogs that think everybody's a terrorist. So anyway. So I need to get a dog basically to protect myself from invaders. Basically. They, I mean, statistically, they say the number one deterrent of burglary is um, is literally like it doesn't matter what size dog, any dog. That's it. It's better than any alarm system. It's just the biggest. Oh, nope. We're not going to go in here. That's fine. So. Okay. So I need like a little dog with a big bark. 
but no chihuahuas. Yeah. Right. Okay. (laughs) Okay. I'll do my research. (laughs) Right. I love it. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I had a blast on your show. Um, and I love everything that you're about, which is why I wanted to get you on here. So for those who don't know who you are, your story, if you would dive into a little bit of that, just so everyone has some context. Yeah, of course. It's it's long, so I'll give I'll try to give you the cliff notes. Let's but, go. That's what the podcast is for. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was saying this kind of when you came on is I don't think that you pick your purpose. I think that it picks you if you have the courage to kind of face the things that you've had to overcome and take the strengths away from those experiences, right? Because they do mold you. And for me, I grew up an athlete, was a division one uh, basketball player in college. I grew up in Vermont. So I took a year off, kind of bet on myself. My mom thought I was absolutely crazy and hired an MBA skills trainer, worked out with some of the best athletes in the world, got my ass beat every single day. I worked at Dave and Buster's. I slept on an air mattress just to like follow a dream. Right. Wow. And, um, I walked on, I took a starting position, made the team. And then I tore my patellar tendon and I thought I was going to go play professionally overseas. And of course the contingency on the contract was if you get injured, like we can just pull out. So that is what happened. And I remember at the same time, um, I had met somebody, I was in a relationship with them and it was the most abusive relationship I I could even imagine. And so I lost not only my identity, but my sense of self and a lot of self-respect. I mean, I totally threw it in the dumpster. And so when I, when I left that relationship and moved home, obviously had to go through surgery, had to go through the whole thing. I was in a straight leg brace for three months or so. Um, and I remember one post-surgery post-op, I found out I was allergic to oxycodone. So I was like, all right. And I remember the second day, right? So I was like, oh, fuck this. I'll just take some ibuprofen. Like it'll be fine. And I was sitting on the couch in my parents' living room and they were at work. So I was home alone. And I got up because I was like, I cannot sit like this. Like, this is just irritating to me to feel worthless and have no meaning or purpose in my life. So I crutched down to where it all started for me, which was the local rec center where I grew up. And I remember going in there the first day, grabbing a basketball and just sitting on the floor and crying. And I was like, I don't know who I am without this. And so through that, I, you know, tried therapy. I did a lot of different things, but I was like, I just need to find a way forward. That's all I cared about was like, I don't want to feel like a nihilist. Like I know that there's purpose for me. I just don't know what it is. And so through that, I tried to then pull over the 24 seven job that, you know, playing high level athletics is it's, it's a full-time job. Oh yeah. And that's where bodybuilding filled that void for me. And it was also a way for me to kind of exert self-loathing onto myself, feeling a lot of the shame from the experience that I had put myself into. And so it was, it's kind of gross to say this, but it was some type of a thrill for like slowly killing yourself. And so that got to a point where I ended up in the hospital and my mom was there. And, you know, the doctor was like, if you don't stop what you're doing, your heart is going to give out. You know, he was like very direct with me. And I remember in that moment, I looked over at my mom because I was numb. I mean, I was numb for a long time. Um, So I didn't care. There were many, many nights where I'd go to bed praying I didn't wake up. Like I was, Mm. I was done with it. And so I remember looking at her and just seeing her eyes well up. And like, if, if you've ever felt a mother's love, like it is, I don't even know how to describe overwhelming. Sure. And I knew I couldn't cause her that pain. And so I remember looking at the doctor and going, to be frank, I don't necessarily give a fuck if I die, but I know that would kill her. So what do I need to do? And so at that point I was like, okay. I'm, I need to just find a way forward. Right. And I, I didn't know which direction to go, but I knew I had to at least stop what I was doing because it wasn't helping me. So that's when I started seeking out a lot of knowledge. Um, I got on the call with Dr. Bill Campbell, um, about his program and he told me he, I would get in like after that phone call. So it was kind of like an interview process. His program has blown up since, since then, um, that I took that and I was like, all right, I'm going to learn, I'm going to learn how to build myself back. Um, if I cannot do it mentally, at least I can do it physically. So that's where I started. And through that, um, I, you know, my business had, when I was playing basketball, I'd go home and help out the younger athletes. Right. I just, cause they looked up to me, nobody from Vermont goes anywhere. Right. And so I'd go <laughs> home and I would teach the younger athletes, the skills that I was learning. So we'd go to the gym, I'd put them through workouts, I'd get them into then lifting and then talk to them about nutrition. 
And so then their parents started reaching out to me. Like, I see what you've done with my kid. Like, can you help me? And I was like, sure. Like, I didn't know what I was doing. And I coached for free for like a super long time. Probably the mm. first two years I was coaching was just like, wow. I wanted to get back because I was still in school. Um, my undergrad was in biology with a concentration in pharmaceuticals. And so that's the path that I was going to go. I was like, I don't need this money. I just want to help people. Like, sure. And then um, there were more and more people that wanted to work with me. And they're like, what do you charge? And I didn't. I didn't know. So I was like, all right, I'll just, you know, 150 bucks a month. Like, I don't know. That's fine with me. So that's kind of where it started going. And then I had to obviously go online once I went to grad school. Um, and I worked under a different business at that time, mostly in the bodybuilding industry. And so I was learning, I was applying, I was physically healing, but, um, a lot of the mental and emotional stuff, I still needed guidance through. And so that's when I got very curious about like, okay, I just want to understand why the fuck I am the way that I am. Like, I don't get it. I don't understand my behaviors. Like, I feel one way on the inside, but I, you know, present myself in a different fashion. So there was a lot of disconnect, which gave me a lot of anxiety, like a lot of anxiety. Right. And so from there, that's when I went down the path of just doing a lot of introspective stuff. And for me, it was like, I always had been curious as a kid. So I knew how to ask really good questions, but I never targeted them at myself. And so then I sat and I was like, okay, well, I just, just going to start asking myself some questions. Like, Okay. And so that's when I started going down the path of like learning why I was the way that I was and kind of resolving things that I hadn't ever given myself permission to explore, if you will. And through that, then of course, I started talking a lot more about like mindset stuff and just sharing what I had learned, what I had gone through, where I had gone. And obviously people could see an evolution in me for how I would even carry myself to presenting myself the way I articulated myself. Um, and then I had kind of established a series of frameworks and mental models and kind of underlying principles that have carried me and, and gotten me out of a very dark place. And so that's what then led to Level Up. So Level Up launched in 2021. So it's about two years old. It was the 17th of July. And from there, I was like, okay, my mission has to be to integrate psychology and physiology, right? Mm -hmm. To help people truly transform their lives because it's not just about the physical stuff right? Sure. That will empower you. And it will show you, you know, how strong you can be and that you are capable physically of overcoming certain things. But if nothing mentally changes about you or your environment or behaviors or perceptions of yourself in, or, or other people in the world, if that doesn't shift at all, then you will inevitably go back to old patterns and old habits because of your conditioning. And so that's when I was like, that's my mission. And I'm entirely passionate about it. Now I'm getting my second master's in clinical psych. So just really want to be the person that I wish that I had. And that's carried me forward every single day into kind of creating what is now the business that I have. I love that. That's so beautiful. You put that, you, you're so eloquent how you, how you speak. Um, I don't know, this could be just my ignorance. Like, I feel like you're so stoic, but I, I don't see stoicism in this. Okay. I'm going to say this and I don't mean it any insult at all. I feel like when people talk about stoicism, it's a very man driven thing. Yep. Right. But, um, but I feel like you have this beautiful balance of stoicism and femininity, if that makes sense. So I will say, um, I didn't know that that was a part of me and kind of my temperament, but I will say that I have been grateful to connect with some brilliant people, um, through online and kind of my message and them finding me and having conversations. And one of the guys that I met, um, who I worked with for a period of time, He's like super stoic, like really into it. his whole page is just about being a stoic dad. Mm. And he was like, do you have any awareness as to the fact that you are entirely a stoic being, but in a feminine energy, like arena? And I was yeah. like, I've not necessarily heard that feedback, but I, I don't find it as a negative piece of feedback. No. Um, it's just certainly an observation, but I think that that's interesting if not, if nothing else, because it's certainly not intentional. I think it's fantastic. I, I, I love the concepts of stoicism. I just don't come across very many women who this, I, again, I don't, for anyone listening, I don't mean this insulting at all. I just don't come across very many stoic women. Maybe it's the people that I see and study, but it's not on purpose, but I very rarely come across anyone who I'm like, wow, you're stoic as fuck, but with a feminine energy. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's amazing. Um, I just think it's great. So <laughs> No, that's an incredible compliment. So thank you for sharing that. I, I take that and I'm honored. So let me ask you this. So, cause this is, this is, this is exactly my wheelhouse. Like we talked about when I was on your, your show, I, I love this world of bringing psychology and physiology or bringing this level of stuff to this arena. Um, so I mean, the, the show is called dieting from the inside out for this exact reason. So for you, 
where does someone start there with, with fixing this kind of stuff? I know you said for you, it started with, um, asking yourself better questions. You're like, well, I'm great at interviewing other people and kind of dissecting others, but I've never thought about it with myself. Is that where you think people should start? Or where does someone start with fixing this for themselves? So I think first and foremost, it has to, they have to have clarity on what the problem is, right? So there's four different stages to what I would say mastery of self, right? So the first stage is kind of ground zero, right? That's unconscious incompetence, meaning that you're you have a problem, but you're not willing to acknowledge that it exists. You're in denial of it, of the thing, right? The thing that is causing you to behave or act or exist in a certain manner. And then you have conscious incompetence, meaning that you're problem aware. So you have a problem, you know, you don't like it. You're not certain how to solve it. And then we get into when they start working with a coach, right? That's our job is to guide them through that, to help them find enlightenment whatever means is best for them, right? It's not my job to tell people what to do. It, my job is to ask good questions to help them find clarity and direction. And so through that dialogue, right, they present the problem and then we talk about it. So I'll ask them some questions. I'll get a little bit deeper on the, on the topic and then I'll say, okay, so now we need to practice conscious competence, meaning that this is going to require a level of mental effort for you to continue to change, right? If you are someone who, who behaves with emotional eating, right? You have to first be aware of the trigger that the fact that you're feeling emotional, and then you have to pause and ask yourself, am I actually hungry or am I going through emotional turmoil, right? There's that. And then the first, one of the first exercises I have people go through is painting a vision of where they want to be. What would your life have to look like for you to be satisfied, right? What does that look like for you? And of course, everyone's vision is different, Mm -hmm. but if we can get very clear on the details of that, we can then think about what type of person would exist in that life, Right. And then we can look at, well, where's the gap, right? You want to be this type of person that has all of these character traits that behaves in these things that stands for these things that has this level of tolerance, right? All of this is very clear as far as temperament, personality, physical, like how they represent themselves physically, but also what they want to embody. And then we can look at where they are. And when I have them do that part of the exercise, the most important thing is to lead with curiosity and not judgment. Mm. Because the moment that you start to label yourself as something you are then predetermining the outcome of your existence. And that's not helpful for anybody that wants to change. And so it's not about judging yourself for what you've done, what you've thought, the actions that you've taken, the habits that you might have cultivated through this point. And by the way, one thing I really like to enlighten people about is that every single habit that we have, every behavior that you embody served a purpose or it wouldn't become a habit. It gave you something in the moment when you were going through something to find an outlet that gave you some type of peace. So then we have to figure out, okay, well, with these coping mechanisms, what is the void? What is the actual problem that is justifying this behavior that's leading you to this? Because there is an internal problem for people and everybody's different there. It could be that they're lonely. It could be like, for example, I work with a lot of high level executives. And so they are always do, 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 do. They have a laundry list of things, tasks to complete, but because their lives are so busy, they don't ever necessarily feel accomplished. So they like video games, right? And this is one of the reasons I think people play video games. So you know when you hit the next level, you know when you've accomplished something, it's very clear. You went from level zero to level three, so you can see a natural progression in something that you've completed, right? So the void that they're filling there is to feel a level of accomplishment. And so, okay, then what steps do we need to take so that you have tactical reviews on the things that you're actually progressing in? Then you will feel accomplished without having to, you know, distract yourself with video games that don't actually serve a purpose. They don't necessarily have utility other than giving you that thing, right? So then we paint the vision and then through those mental model practices that I will deploy, depending on the person, what the problem is, where they want to go, who they want to become, right? That's hopefully over time and with practice and intention, we go from conscious competence to unconscious competence, meaning that you naturally select to engage with these things because they bring you closer to truly embodying that person. But you don't also have to delay the time horizon in which it requires you to be that person. That's another thing. If you know exactly how they would act and the things that they would do naturally, if you want to be a fit person, well, how do they act? They usually go to the gym, they eat some protein, they're going to get walks, they're going to stay hydrated, right? They might meditate, like whatever your vision of a healthy person is, you don't have to wait until you've lost 20 pounds to be that. You just start behaving in that manner, right? But a lot of people talk about discipline. And so one thing I tell people is we have to have a vision first because without a vision, there is no discipline. You don't know what you need to say no to because you don't have clarity, right? And you're you're not necessarily oriented towards anything. And then of course, the most important part is you have to be committed because if you're only interested 
when the storms come, it's very easy to behave and check the boxes when life is easy. Sure. Right. And so the expectations that I set for individuals is I want on your worst days for you to be good. Because if mm -hmm. we can make good your baseline, your great days are going to be exceptional. But at worst, you are still good. Mm -hmm. And that's good enough. And so then you take out the concept of failure because you can't fail. Sure. Right? Even if your worst days, you're just good. You're moving no matter how fast or slow, still oriented towards the objective outcome that you're seeking. And that's still good enough. And so that's kind of how I would start with people is first, you have to know what the problem is that you want to fix, right? And then you have to go, okay, well, if this life isn't satisfying to me, what type of life would be? What would life have to look like for me to be satisfied, right? Because now you know what you're missing. That's great. Then we can figure out how do we get you from there to having a life that embodies all those different elements for you right? And what does that look like? And then you get tactical with that. And then you go deeper with reflections, but you need action too, right? If we just sit here and have a conversation, that's great. We might find clarity, but clarity doesn't do anything without a sense of action or tactical steps to then move closer to that thing. So it has to be a combination of the two things to make sure that you're helping that person progress in a direction that is fulfilling to them. I love that. That's so, that's so well put. It's just like on a beautiful Venn diagram. You just have to have both and then just go in the, the intersecting points. Um, it's the reason I started smiling when you were talking about some of this stuff is because it, it, it made it made a lot of sense for me because like let's say because I've always been for years now I've my my downfall is I'll be in like I, I came up in like the what we call the high achiever space where it's just like go 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 the, like you were just talking about but whenever I'm I want to unplug and just do my, like some people will like watch bullshit TV or they'll go do whatever their, whatever their mindless activity is. Mine is a little bit of video games, ironically, where if I'm like, all right, I'm done working. I just want to shut my brain off. And if I don't want to do anything, I like, if I'm not like trying to meditate or whatever. I just want to like, just be lazy. I'll play video games. <laughs> yeah. And I think again, like some people are so emotionally um, drained by the end of their day. Right. If their if their job is something that requires lots of mental energy and high focus. Yeah. Right. And it's it's you are serving people, so you're interacting with them. Right. So you need to be very present and you need to be attentive. You need to listen. Because if you're gonna help anybody, if you're distracted in your thoughts, you're not listening. If you're not listening, you can't pick up the pieces of their language that you need to pull out and extract and have them reflect on. So that's a lot of mental energy. And then you get to a point where it's like, okay, I have time, but I also don't want to keep exerting energy mentally. I actually feel stupid by the end of some days because my brain is like clay I'm like i have nothing I, I can't even articulate myself appropriately right now right and so that's when you might go into an activity that is just giving you joy that's giving you decompression right so what i try to get people to understand too is that the behaviors in themselves are not bad having a drink is not bad eating cookies is not bad right none of those things are bad it's the intention behind the activity so if you're someone who goes to the bar every night after work because you cannot stand the stress and you can't go home to your wife because you know she's going to rip your head off about something, right? Well, you're coping with it in a negative way. It's not like, oh, I'm with somebody and I'm having an experience and I'll never eat here again. And they have a cocktails list and I want one. Like, I just want to enjoy that. That's it. That's sometimes that's it. And that's also okay. And so when we look at behaviors, right? A lot of times people are like, oh, you don't have discipline because you ate this or you drank that, right? You're not healthy. It's like, hold on. You don't know that you're speculating, maybe based on your own frame of reference. Maybe that's how you utilize that item. It's the intentions that you go into it with, right? And so a lot of people project all the time, right? And I'm sure you're aware of this too. Oh, yeah. And so that's where it's like, when people give you feedback, you don't have to internalize it, especially if you know who you are, what you stand for, what your intention is behind what you do, because you're operating in, this is a buzzword, but consciously, right? <laughs> then nothing that anybody ever says about you can, can debilitate you unless it resonates with you as true. And if it is true, that's also okay. Because if it's true and people give you that feedback, you then get to decide if you want to change it. And if you don't want to change it, then who cares? Fuck you. You're right. Yeah. I can be a bitch. Totally true. 100%. But sometimes I need to be. And so that's where it's like, you don't also have to feel bad about you being the way that you are. So long as, again, it's embodying a version of you that you're proud of. Do you like yourself when you're by yourself, knowing all of your strengths, your weaknesses, your, your demons, right? All of that. And if you do, and you have peace with it, then that's where you develop what I like to call unshakable levels of confidence because no outside daggers are going to penetrate you to a point that is going to make you sacrificial. And I think that that's where a lot of people then find freedom because you don't have to conform to things that boxes and, and different 
roads that weren't built for you. That's not you. You don't have to be that either. You're good enough as you are. You just have to give yourself permission to be that. Mm, that's so good. It's interesting. When you said that, that reminded me, um, uh, back in April, I was speaking at an event in Arizona and, uh, Tom Billy was also speaking. And one thing Tom said is, uh, one of his big filters on his life, as he mentioned, um, do you like yourself when you're by yourself? And he had a whole, he talked a lot about that, but I think a lot of people, that's where they go South is I think most people, it's why they avoid being with themselves. Like it blows me away in the diet space. The amount of people who's willing to eat a 1200 calorie keto diet and work out 18 days a week, they'll do that. But if I say, I want you to sit and listen to silence for three minutes and we'll call it meditation, but just sit in silence and hold space for whatever comes up. They're like, I, I just can't. I just, there's, I, I just can't. And it's, I think it's all kind of ties together. Well, and I think that that's very interesting. So one thing that I do with a lot of people who are like really interested in meditating, but they can't sit still for three minutes. Mm-hmm. I always tell my clients, I just want you to practice a mindful minute. Just one, one a day, right? So you grab your phone, you set a timer for one minute, you turn off everything around you and you sit with yourself. You can close your eyes. If you have a thought, you don't have to judge it or interact with it. Just observe it. See what comes up. You don't have to like freak out about it or judge yourself or feel like you have to think of anything. You might not. That's okay too. And so I start them off with a minute because it's easy for anybody to sit there and be quiet for a minute. Totally. Right. And then you can start to progress them up to two minutes and then three minutes and then five minutes and then five minutes might be good enough, but sometimes they might want more than that. But once you can start to be quiet for a period in a a very small period, you'll be amazed at really what comes up if you give yourself permission to be aware of what's coming up, which is another thing, especially with people that are on the side of the ambition coin, right? A lot of them suppress their emotions or thoughts or just their, their own internal needs because your job as an ambitious person, especially if this, you've grown up in at least our age range, right? was always to like, don't cry, be quiet, go do the thing, shut up about it, like be disciplined. It's supposed to suck. You will suffer. That's fine. And that's all true. But there's also the pendulum has to swing, right? If you go to one extreme, inevitably you will swing back and hit the other. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where a lot of people find breaking points. That's where burnout is hit, right? You've done, 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 done. Go, 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 go. Achieve, 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 achieve. And then you're like, fuck, I can't think. I don't want to do anything. Fuck you. I don't want to talk to you. You're an asshole. When really you haven't created any space for you to just breathe for five minutes. And so it's like these little tools can help people find peace in the chaos because the chaos is inevitable. And so it's not about avoiding the chaos at all because it does have a purpose. It's about figuring out how do you navigate it objectively, right? And not reactive. And the only way that you can do that is to find some point of peace in that somewhere for you to then have an objective space to work from. I agree with that. Totally. That's, that's, that's an amazing way to put it. Um, I always tell people like you have to earn the right for it to be relaxing. I think, cause I think the big reason when people are so, um, against it or so have so much resistance to it, resistance to it is they have an expectation. They sit down and they go, well, my brain wouldn't shut up. So I did it wrong. Like you're judging it and you have an expectation. Well, I didn't feel any better. Well, right. Well, you haven't done this long enough. If I have two salads, I'm not shredded yet, but you meditate twice and you're not Zen as fuck. It, it's no wonder. So for people who are in that camp, who realize they probably should, because I talk about it all the time, especially the listeners here, but that's usually the objections that come up. Oh, I don't have time. I can't. I've got ADHD. Um, my brain won't shut up. I can't sit still. I think these are all a reason to do it more. It just shows the lack of a skill set as well. But what is your, what are your thoughts on that? So first and foremost, I like to share, I also have ADHD, like wild (laughs) amounts of ADHD. Yeah. But I don't want to be on medication. Again, that's a personal decision, but I find it to be more of a superpower than not. And it's just like your thoughts and it's just like your emotions and it's just like your intuition, right? That will lead you down the right path more often than not. And so one thing that I taught myself very early was stay detached from the outcome of things because it might not be all that you thought it could be, but it might be significantly better. But by you trying to put pressure on yourself, because that's what's happening. You have an expectation of what this experience is supposed to be like. And when it's not like that, you feel like something's wrong with you, right? But logically, that doesn't even make any sense. You've never done it. So you should not know what to expect. So expect nothing. And then there's no pressure. 
And when there's no pressure, then you're going to be much more objective and present with what's actually going on. But if the whole time you're thinking about, I'm supposed to be not thinking about anything, but I, I'm thinking about everything. And then I'm like, oh my God, I can't think of anything or try to get clarity. Am I supposed to have a vision? Am I supposed to really be quiet? Is nothing supposed to be going on upstairs, but everything's going on upstairs. I have ADHD, right? And then you feel like none of it's productive because the whole time that dialogue is you judging yourself about the experience that you're trying to experience, which is preventing you from experiencing the thing that you need to experience because you have expectations. And so this is one of the most important things that I think people would do well with, whether it's in meditation, whether it's navigating your fitness journey, whatever that is, is you have to stay detached from the outcome of it because it's not going to go as fast as you want it to. And it's certainly not going to be as smooth, right? And so people don't like to accept that there are certain elements of the human experience that we cannot change. Sadness, frustration, stress, fatigue, heartbreak, loneliness, like all of these things, depression and anxiety. Everybody feels those things at certain periods of their life. You, they're unavoidable, but they will teach you something. And that lesson is entirely necessary. But if you don't take the lesson from the experience, you become resentful. And nobody wants to be around resentful people because they're negative and destructive. And so if you don't want to be a resentful person, right, then you need to look at the experiences that you go through as something that you should be grateful for. Right. At least that is my perception of my own life, because there are lots of things that I could sit here and be very reactive and angry about. I could be a very bitter woman, but I would not be who I am without them. Right. And I wouldn't know what I know. I wouldn't have the curiosity to seek out all the things that I have. I wouldn't be able to help people the way that I do if I didn't go through all the shit that I went through. And I certainly wouldn't be who I am or, or know myself or value myself the way that I do if I didn't have the courage to go under the hood and go, this is some pretty dark shit you got under here. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Right. But then once you integrate your shadow, you can do a lot of positive things with that. Because sure. right? I think it's important to know that you are full of the ability to be destructive. Every single human. And if you're in denial about that, then you don't understand your own nature. Every single human can be massively destructive if they want to. The difference is in what you choose to do with it. Right. So then you can start to know when to deploy those certain aspects of yourself and when not to. And when you can channel that energy into something that is meaningful and more positive. And you think that if you can give yourself permission to focus on, can you win one day? Can you meditate for one minute? You don't have to do it again. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. Can you do it for one minute? Right. Can you be consistent for a day? Can you try to be your future self for just one day? We can stop. We can role play. We can stop role playing after that. If that's cool with you. But I just want you to try it on for size today. And when you do that, it removes the pressure of, oh, I've been consistent for a day. Now I have to be consistent for a week. I've got to be consistent for six fucking months. Are you kidding me? It seems forever away. Yeah. But slow is steady and steady is fast. And so it's not about how quickly you can get to the desired outcome that you have because you've got expectations and pressures around it. It's how consistent can you be walking the path that will inevitably get you there? Can you take one more step? Do you have the ability to endure it? Because if you do, and again, that's why you need to know why you're doing it in the first place and what vision you're trying to create. Because if there's no meaning behind it, you won't. You'll give in to every impulse that you ever have because it doesn't mean anything to you. And that's another big thing that I want people to understand is it's not about what you want to want. What do you mean by that? So society, for example, there's a lot of cultural pressures, men and women both right now. I feel like there's a lot of battles between the sexes and we come, become more ad adversarial than we have as far as t a team. And they think that as a woman, I can say from a young age, you're taught, focus on your career, right? 18. Then you get to college. Take this seriously. It will be the most important thing that ever happens to you. And then you get a job and it's like, you need to climb the ladder here. This is the most important thing that will ever happen to you. You need your independence, right? That's a lot of cultural pressure for you to conform into something. But if indeed you get to that doctorate degree and you get to your PhD and you realize you just did that to make money and the, the work itself has no meaning behind it, right? You're not going to do a good job. You're just going to do the minimum effective dose of what is required of you to do the job but not because it means anything to you, right? And then you'll look back and wish you had done something different and you'll regret it, but you can't leave it because it brings you good money, right? And money is a whole thing that society tells you you need to make more money because that makes you more valuable as a person. Just like women, you need to be smaller because if you're smaller, you're more attractive. And if you're more attractive, then more men will want you. And isn't that what makes a woman high value is her looks. And so there's all of this kind of things and you're told to want to want that. You need to want that. But then there are people uh. that are like, I don't, I don't want to get an, a six-year degree. I don't want to get a PhD. I don't want to be a doctor. I want to be a stay-at-home mom. And then we demonize that. Yeah. We do. And so it's it's not about what you feel pressured to want in life, right? If you don't want to lose weight, it doesn't matter if I give you the perfect blueprint for a plan. You will not do it, 
right? That's one thing, or you don't believe you can, but that's a totally different conversation. But you need to know what it is that you actually want, which is why I asked the question, what would your life have to look like to be satisfying to you? Because that gives people permission to speak on what would make their life look ideal. And in that, they'll find clarity around the relationship that I'm in sucks. My boss is a dick. I hate going into the office every day. I hate the culture there, right? My friend group is always tearing me down. They want me to go out and party, but I really don't want to party anymore. Like I wouldn't do that, right? And so then they start to construct the truth for you without having you having to probe about what do you want or why do you want it, right? Those are kind of aggressive questions. Then you can see this person actually wants these things, but they built their life around what they thought they had to want. And so that's where you get a lot of clarity and objectivity as to what is meaningful to that individual outside of the pressures that we face in everyday today life. Do you find, <clears throat> do you find people once they, let's say they start to get that clarity and what the, we'll call the truth is like, wow, everything I thought I wanted, I don't want all these things that I grew up uh, thinking is the the way is not now. Um, but now there's, but now they're like, cool, this is what I want. But now it goes in direct opposition to their conditioning. And now all the resistance in the world sets in. Is there any way that you like to teach around navigating that resistance? Yep. So in order to become somebody different, you have to do things differently to be somebody who's different and then become that entity over a period of time. So again, if, if somebody comes to me and they're like, I realize that I am living a life that I fucking hate. That is terrifying to them, by the way. And so if I were to respond with like, holy fuck, you, you've, you've dug yourself a hole, I would not be doing a good job. So when somebody comes to me from with that standpoint, I go, okay, well, we can do anything, but we can't do everything. And we certainly can't do everything all at once. And so then I explore what is the little step that we can take in that direction right now? What is the one thing that all of this is terrifying because like you have a whole life with like lots of attachments to that thing. So what is the one thing that you, that feels comfortable for you to face right now? Right. Because they need to have the courage to face it. You cannot force somebody to face a fear without their will. They don't get more brave during that. Right. And the thing is <laughs> when you, when you face something that you're terrified by, right. The thing doesn't become less scary. Think about when you're a child. And you learn to ride a bike. The first time you look at the bicycle, you're like, fuck, if I fall, I'm going to scrape my knee. I'm going to smash my head. Like you're terrified of that thing, but you get on and then you have the, the safety wheels, right? And you go through that and then you take them off and all of a sudden those aren't there. So you're a little bit shaky, but over time and over exposing yourself to that thing, the bicycle itself still has all of the capabilities to hurt you the way that it did the first time you saw it. So it's not less terrifying. You've just become more brave. Mm. And so I use that in the same system of like, what is the smallest fear that we're willing to address right now that you are willing to address right now? Where are you comfortable starting? Right? It has to be a collaborative thing. I cannot dictate what somebody needs to do in their life. Right. And again, if I were to do that in an assertive manner, they would be not willing or open to the courage that they have to overcome that thing. And so that's where you have to meet people where they are first and foremost. And there's got to be a lot of trust there. Because they've just told you something that is absolutely, again, terrifying. And what you also don't want to do is feel like you're controlling the outcome of their situation. It needs to be under their control so that no matter what happens, they're at peace with it. Because it was their choice, not yours. And so that's where I start, though, is, is very small steps. Right? We can't do everything all at once. And it will drive you insane to try to do so. And your anxiety will go through the roof. <laughs> right? And so that's, that's not setting somebody up for success. And so we have to start with the smallest thing. The smallest thing that they're willing to do. I love that. I think this is where the the tactical side of 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 the concept of being present is. I guess I think especially in the world of transformation and all this stuff and changing like one's life, uh, we want to be anywhere what the, but this moment. This moment it makes all decision making easy. Is what is the one step? What is the one action? The one intention? The one effort? The one whatever? But when anxiety and sadness and overwhelm comes in, it's like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this next eight months? Or, well, I've always been this way. I've always struggled like this from when I was little and we're anywhere but right now. But right now is the only thing that can move the needle and ground us ironically. And I think that's why I, I feel being present is one of the most tactical things you can do on this journey. I think it's, I think that's 100% true. 
Because I, I think that unfortunately your life will pass you by if you're always living in the past and in the future because you haven't experienced anything in this moment. And I think the most exciting thing ever, though people get terrified when they think about it, is that you are one decision away from an entirely different life. I could literally look up an apartment today and move across the country. I could choose to do that. If I was in a relationship and I decided I was unhappy, I could leave it. Right. If I was in a job, I, I, you can't, you have the ability to make these changes, right? A lot of people feel chained to the lives that they live because they don't see a way out. And so they feel obligated by things I like to call stakeholders. So it could be friends, family, bosses, whatever, whatever things that put pressure on you to keep doing what you're doing, especially if you don't like it. It's the friends that you go out with and you don't want to drink at the bar, but then they're like, here, have a drink, right? It's impacted your behavior. If you went there by yourself, you wouldn't have. But in the presence of different people, they impact your behavior. And so it's very important to pay attention to who your stakeholders are because you want to then ex explore that relationship and decide, is it, is it reciprocal? Do they make me better? Is there benefits on both ways? Do I enjoy serving this person? Right? Am I better because they're in my life? And are they better because I'm at theirs, right? There, it needs to be go both ways. And then you can find clarity on a lot of the times there's addition by subtraction. Mm -hmm. And so like having the courage to set a boundary is difficult for a lot of people. Having the courage to walk away from something that they know doesn't serve them requires them to have a level of one, self-respect, but two, a knowingness in who they are and what they're capable of so that it doesn't matter what environment they're placed in, that they will find a way. And when we talk about confidence, I think there's a lot of like guru stuff on be more confident. Um, but underlying all of that, like, at least for me, confidence comes from competence and competence comes from skill and skill comes from practice. And so that's where, again, you can't, you can't be so attached to your success in navigating something that you've never navigated before. You will be disappointed and you will quit before you start. And so that's where it's like, okay, well, if I'm just practicing, I have a rule of 100. I do this with everything. Right? I can't judge myself until I've done something a hundred times. Because if you do something five times and you compare one to five, well, they're going to look very similar. If you do something a hundred times and you compare 100 to one, I guarantee it's gotten better. And that's the thing that you need to be excited about. It's not the first time and not the fifth time and not the 20th time and not the 70th time, but the fucking hundreds. Because you need to look back at point one and then how far you've come. And I think oftentimes, especially in health and fitness and weight loss, people always think about how far they have to go, not how far they've come. Sure. And when I say that, even people are going to think about weight. I'm not talking about weight. I'm talking about how do you feel about yourself? How do you show up in your day to day? What better choices are you making? What things are you now capable of saying no to? Right. All of these different things that have nothing to do with about with the scale. But whenever you talk about it, right, people always think weight is the, the thing that measures their success when they don't understand that it's your mind and it's your behavior. And if none of those things are changing because you can do something very rigidly for 12 weeks, <laughs> I can guarantee the success that you've just tasted is going to go right out the other side very quickly. I would agree with that completely. So, so when you, so along those lines, how do, how do you truly set someone up for success for like ever? Like if you're like, I'm going to show you to never struggle ever again, like that massive outlandish claim, it, where, how do you set them up for success in that context? So our program is strong, fit, free. And so I always tell people, and the purpose behind that is one, you need to be strong so that you aren't attacked by others, right? And that's a personal thing for me. Fit mentally, right? So that you aren't attacked by yourself. Mm. But underneath those two umbrellas, you have all of the systems and tools to implement a level of freedom. But that has to be earned. You don't just walk in and intuitively eat. You've been intuitively eating your whole life. That's not going to end well. Right. And so you have to also remember that you are not equipped yet to get there. That's what I have to teach you. And so everybody's different. And so what we do is we have an examination call and we build a blueprint for them. I'm looking at their life. I'm looking at their schedule. I'm looking at their relationships. I'm looking at their stress management. I'm talking, I'm looking at their sleep and their circadian rhythm. I'm looking at the, their whole life. And I'm going, okay, then I can build them a blueprint that's catered to their schedule. Right. This is what I need you to focus on. This is what I need you to do. This is what you need you to do if that's what you want. Right. So you have to be willing to make sacrifices along the way because you're not equipped. So the first phase is always checking to see if they're fundamentally sound because we can't build anything on a crack foundation. It will never lead you anywhere long term. And so 
that depends on the person and their behaviors, their habits, their emotional things, like all of those coping strategies. But we need to figure out where they are on a fundamental level. Like what knowledge do they have? What skill sets do they have? How are they coping? Like what are they willing to do? What are they not willing to sacrifice? That's a very important question. Yeah. Right. And then we can get clarity on direction and set expectations around that. Right. So my expectation is one that you communicate, two that you're open, three that you're willing. Very simple. I don't ask a lot, but you've got to be able to do those things. And through that process, again, first we focus on foundations around fitness, around working out, around all those things, right? Because people need to find that they are capable of more first before they're willing to go do the inside work, Mm. right? People don't want to start there most of the time. They're like, I already feel like shit. I don't think I'm capable of anything, right? I don't have the ambition to go fucking fight the world and the demons around them. So it's like, okay, cool. Let's focus on showing you, giving you evidence, because in order to rewire a belief for somebody, they have to have an experience that tells them that an alternative truth is possible. So I need to give them evidence that they are capable of more than they believe that they are. And we do that through strong foundations. And so that's where we start because they get more energy. They feel more confident. They're lifting more weight. They're seeing progress. They can control their impulses a little bit better, right? And they're seeing that come to fruition. They're doing more than they thought that they could. And then we can get into a lot of mental models, right? So once they're fundamentally sound and they know how to navigate the gym, they know how to train, they know enough about food, they know what serves their body, what makes them feel good, what moves the needle forward, what gives them energy, what takes away from it, right? We've explored all of these different things. Then we get into the mentally fit aspect of it, which one, they have more confidence and they're ready. People have to be ready. I hate when people are like, you're never going to be ready. I do believe ready is a lie to some degree. But you can't force people to attack their own demons if they're not willing to face them in the first place. Again, they're at that unconscious incompetent level and you can't force people to see what's under the hood if they're not willing to go there. They'll just be reactive and highly like deny the entire issue that they have. And so you'll find when you when you get people to that level, they'll start to open up more about themselves. They'll start to talk about the things that are going on and the things that they're struggling to combat with. And that's when you can start to get down a lot of mental models and frameworks that obviously depend on what the person is struggling with, right? What is the thing that they are, they're battling? And again, most people, when it comes to food, if they have coping issues and we, we screen for all of those behavioral things around fitness and nutrition, right, that we've started to tackle. And what that tells them is that they're in more control of their autonomy and their behavior than they think that they are. But there tends to be another avenue of their life where they can't deploy the same thing. And what I tell people a lot is that I teach it through fitness because the fundamentals of fitness and athletics and all those things carry over into every other arena of your life, right? You've been successful with your fitness because you were consistent, because you had a plan, because you, because you could say no to things, because you could set boundaries, because you're willing to push yourself and go through the suffering that was required for you to see change. So if those are the things that make you successful in fitness, do you not think that those are the same things that will make you successful in your relationship, in your business? in your career, in your friendship groups, right? But that level of tolerance doesn't carry over. That skill set doesn't carry over. And so then we look at how do we carry that over into different arenas? How do you start to advocate for yourself? How do you start to set boundaries? How do you communicate effectively when you're dealing with other people, right? What do you do when you can't control the outcome of things and you're a control freak, right? There's lots of different things that people struggle with outside of it. But the fundamental principle is what underlied their success in the first place. And that's where you have to pay attention to the client Because different systems will set each of them up to be successful in different ways. But then you can point out their strengths and what they respond best to, what works for them. And then you can go, okay, well, we need to do something in a similar fashion, but integrate that into this arena. And then you map that out with them. And that's when they start to, I mean, the coolest thing about what I do, and I'm I'm working on a client survey to get stats on this, the number of women that will, and I work with men too, but majority women, right? The number of women that will leave their careers and get new jobs or they get raises, which is awesome because they start taking up space and advocating for themselves, right? They're more productive at work. Um, they're more engaging. So that's been amazing. Um, women that will also leave relationships, especially if they're toxic, right? Cause we tend to, when you, a lot of fitness to me is a representation of your level of self-respect. Somebody looks good one, they're disciplined two, they're hardworking, but three, they know they're meant for more and they're capable of more and they want to push themselves in that direction, right? They can do hard things. They don't tolerate a bunch of bullshit. They're not lazy. And so when you start to improve your level of self-respect, right, you start to tolerate less bullshit in your life because you no longer tolerate it from yourself. 
And so then that carries over into people's relationships. Again, their their careers, their livelihoods, their parenting. I mean, there's so many things that have a carryover effect. And it all started from them having the courage to prove to themselves that they were capable of more than they ever thought that they were. That's so good. That's so good. Um, I don't even know what to add on to that. That's so good. <laughs> I just want to be quiet. Just let you keep talking. <laughs> um, that's amazing. Let me ask you this. <clears throat> um, do you know, well, I mean, you, you basically said it. Cause one thing that I've noticed in that I've caught myself saying is if you go through a transformation of any sort and you only lose weight, I, I personally feel like you did it wrong. If the only outcome that happens is you lost a little bit of weight, you look a little bit better in, cl- in your clothes, which is great. Um, you did it wrong. But if you do this game the right way, you have such an internal transformation that it affects every single area in your life, your work, your relationship, your money, your happiness, your mental health, your marriage, your, your everything, because you're, you're changing the fundamentals of who you are, um, which again, touch everything. So one thing I will say around that is that I think people are focused on the wrong things. Mm. If you only focus on the scale, you're not focusing on yourself. And if you're not focusing on yourself, you're not observing the changes that are happening. You're not, if you're not acknowledging the fact that you just said no to something you would always say yes to. If you're not noticing the fact that you've gone to the gym five days in a row when the, for the last five years, you couldn't get off the couch. If you're not acknowledging that you feel better eating certain foods and not eating others that you previously would have eaten, your focus is not on the right things. And if you're only focusing on the scale and the desired weight that you want to achieve more than anything, Nothing about you is actually changing. You're just exerting a high level of willpower, which is great. But when that stops and you reach that goal, none of your behaviors you've audited, none of your feelings or emotions or the things that have made you resilient carry over. And then you go back into, I mean, your conditioning to that point has been so long. The time horizon on that is is massive. And so it's also more comfortable for you to exist there. Right? That's the difference is when you're fighting who you were and who you want to become and you're stuck in an environment and environment changes this a lot. Think about when you go see your family, for example, yeah. right? When you're a kid, there's certain roles that you played in that family dynamic. And there's a lot of pressure for you to be that all the time when you're with that person or in that, in that environment. And then when you're by yourself, you get to be who it is that you are, who you've become, who you want to be. Right. But then there's this conflict when you're in that presence, which I think is why family gatherings can be so anxiety ridden for a lot of people right? They're, they're not necessarily aware of it, but there were expectations on the past version of you. But there's also expectations that you have for who you are today. And when you're faced with those two things, there's a lot, and there's a lot of pressure to conform back to that thing. Cause for a long period of time, depending on how long you were in that environment for, that was comfortable. And so that's when you're faced with, did you end the journey? Right. And that's where I tell people, I don't, I love psychology because I don't know that there is ever an end. Right. The more that I learn about myself, the more I realize that there's more questions and the more questions that I have, the more unknown variables that there are, which makes it more exciting for me. Cause I'm, I'm a curious cat from, you know, the beginning of time of my sure. time. <laughs> and so I like that. I like not knowing things because it tells me that I can continue to seek out more knowledge and hopefully I'll get closer to answering that question. But I think that the hard part for people is that because we are so focused on the outcome, we don't focus on the process of who are we becoming in the pursuit of the outcome. And if you don't focus on who you're becoming through that pursuit, the odds are that you carry the identity forward after your transformation is over is minimal. Mm. Do you, do you ever have people, this is something that I, I will see, <clears throat> um, not as necessarily as much with clients. Cause when someone's by that point, by that point, they, they usually get it. I get this more in like the DMS and emails and stuff like that. People who go, Hey, I get what you're saying about this, like deeper stuff, change all these levels. And they're like downplaying it, but I want to lose weight. Like you don't understand. I really need to lose the weight. Now you don't understand. I need a whatever. And they basically dismiss a lot of that. They're like, I get what you're saying, but, and then they talk about how they want to lose weight. Now, is there a way you approach that person? I would ask them questions. So again, for me, like I never want to judge somebody's frame of reference because to be quite frank, I've never been obese. I don't know what it's like to need to lose 50 to hundred pounds. I, I'm not going to pretend that I do. I've worked with lots of people that have, but the leading question to that would, from me would be how many times have you tried to lose this weight? Mm. Right. How long has that cycle gone on? And did you gain this weight because you lost weight previously and didn't have an exit strategy? what got you, what got you here? Right. Because repeating the same thing that you've done over and over again, is just insanity truly. And we need to stop being insane people. So we need to ask right questions because if it worked for you previously, it's not working now, it's not going to work for you in the future. And so if you want to keep running that right race, that is your decision to make. 
I'm not going to judge you either way because it doesn't impact my life. But if you truly want somebody to impact yours, then you have to be willing to do it different, to be different and become different and achieve a different result, which means it's going to feel uncomfortable and it should because it's new and that's okay. But if you're not willing to do something new, if you're not willing to try anything different, that's totally your avenue to pick, man. Like I'm not going to judge you. But if you've done this a million times and you're still stuck trying to lose the same 10, 15, 20, 30 pounds, it's like, well, how about you just try this on for size? (laughs) Like, are you willing to do something different? Mm. Because if they're not willing, then you can't help them either way. Right. And that's something they unfortunately will probably have to go through another round of trying to diet, buying into some program, doing the same surface level shit. And then ending up back to where they were square one. And the only thing that that's doing is preventing them from achieving what it is they want most because they're expanding the time horizon for their own success. But it's because just like anything else, if you want to be successful at anything, right? We want to like show up at the gym and like be Kobe Bryant, like pick up a ball and like Steph Curry. And it's like, (laughs) that's not how it worked, right? They spent their whole lives doing foundational work, dribbling a basketball, going between the legs, shooting from, you know, inside the free throw line over and over the boring shit doing the boring fundamental shit. And so if you have a series of belief systems that do not serve where you want to go, do you not think it would be fundamental for you to change that first? Right. And so that's where it's like, you can keep trying to show up and be disappointed that you're not Steph Curry every time you shoot a three point, like from the three point line, you can do that. But it's because you haven't put in the work to be fundamentally sound first. And he did. Right. A lot of times we see people that have achieved success, but we'd never consider how long they've gone, what sacrifices they made, how hard that it was, right? How how long it actually took people, right? Like nobody's super transparent about that stuff. And that's what makes it hard because then we believe if we don't achieve it in 12 weeks, like somebody online said that they did, something's wrong with us. It's like, no, the fact that you think that is true is what's wrong with you is you have external pressures on you to be somebody that you're not, and you never will be. So like, this is what you've got to work with. These are the tools that you've got. Like, this is your hand. How do you want to play it? And you have to take control of that. Nobody else can do it for you. I love that. I love that. I, I know I keep saying that, but I just, I, I feel like we're so aligned on all this stuff that it's, this, this is exactly why I wanted you to come on. So um, this has been fantastic. I greatly appreciate this. Um, where can people find you? Amazing. I appreciate you having on me, having me on here. Um, so I am Kate and Michelle on Instagram, on Twitter, on threads. Um, I do have a podcast. It's called Elevate, E-L-E-V and the number eight. Uh, if you want to hear more of my long form content, it's also on YouTube. Uh, but yeah, that's where you can find me. I love it. Awesome, girl. Well, thank you again for doing this and we'll be in touch soon. Thank you so much. See ya. All right, we are back. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of Dieting from the Inside Out. I know if you stuck around for the whole thing, you got a ton of value out of this and you're going to want to go, we well, are going to want to go follow Kate and you're going to want to start implementing the stuff that we talked about. So um, now before you go, I do have a few things. Number one is, like I said, absolutely reach out, reach out to Kate, reshare this episode, um, tell her that you heard her on the show and things like that. Number two, um, if you haven't subscribed to the show, be sure and subscribe uh, because you, we, you need to be notified whenever we have these these really amazing episodes drop and with these uh, these these guests that are just top of the line. So be sure and subscribe to the show. If you can, leave me a review because it helps us more than you can imagine. So wherever you're listening to this on, if you could leave a five-star review and give your honest thoughts on the show about how it's helped you, it would mean more than you know. Um, but before you go, we do have a few things for you in the description. Number one is I have my, my, uh, my actual fat loss course. If you're not sure where to get started and you're just kind of new to this and you're like, I don't even know the right way to do this without my life sucking, go through my fat loss checklist course. It's a five day email course. It'll change everything for you. Secondly, um, if let's say, you know what to do, you're just struggling with like the, the, like you just feel alone, right? Like your friends don't get it. Your husband don't get it. Your kids don't care. And like your friends are insecure. So when you start losing weight, they start poking fun at you or whatever. You need a community. You need a tribe of people around you that is your home base where you can go to, to get love done, to get supported, to get held, held accountable and to get the information that you need and your questions answered. And I have that all inside a free Facebook group called fat loss simplified that I'm in it every week. It's a game changer. So I'll leave a link to add yourself down there. And then finally, if you are sitting there and you're just like, I'm done having to figure this out on my own. I'm tired of the mental gymnastics going through all this yo-yo diet trial error. I'm tired of 
like everything I've done is, isn't working. Let's say you've been dieting for like the last several years or even decades and you're just ready to be done and you don't want to have to make the decisions anymore. And you just need some one-on-one -on -one higher level accountability. You can always apply for a slot in our coaching, in our, in our coaching program. The cool thing is because you're coming from the podcast, I let you essentially go to the front of the line. So I have a special podcast link if you're applying for coaching because you're already a higher caliber person with this stuff because you're coming from my show. So you can go straight to the front of the line. Um, if you go through the link in the podcast, and then I also have some stuff going on where if you do get accepted into coaching, I'm giving you like $4,000 worth of free stuff, which is pretty cool. Uh, but otherwise I'll leave that down there. Otherwise I appreciate you tuning in uh, again this week. Check out uh, next week's episode. Cause this could be crazy. I love you. And I will talk to you next time. Mm -hmm.